So today for you um, in this uh, hall in the uh, early morning will be something that uh, will make you feel things about uh, things that are uh, not in the, uh, the three-dimensional or six-dimensional uh, space that you uh, see or uh, that you can touch. But um, uh, our first speaker today will uh, tell you about uh, how to evoke emotions uh, with uh, or uh, to kind of uh, sculpture art from things that are maybe not not nothing more than thin air but um, that will uh, nevertheless touch you so uh, first talk today is uh, called visceral systems approaches to working with sound and network data transmissions as a sculptural medium. And our talker today, uh, first talker, is uh, Sarah Grant. Give a warm round of applause for Sarah. Thank you. So yeah, good morning. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me here at CCC. Um, I'm really excited to give this talk. Actually, it's uh, um, something I've been thinking about for a long time, and I'm, I'm happy to, to present it to you this morning. And also, thank you for coming here. I know that, that 11.30 is quite early for a morning at uh, CCC. So, so yeah. Um, my name is Sarah Grant. Um, I'm, a me I'm a media artist and an educator. Um, I'm part of the Weise Sieben studio uh, in, in Berlin. Um, and I'm interested in systems, radio waves, computer networks, and also sculpture. Um, I have an arts practice with networking technology as my medium and also a teaching practice that works to promote internet literacy, um, cracking open this black box that we know of as the cloud, um, bringing awareness that there are alternatives to commercial providers if we want to, example, simply host our own website or run our own uh, co community network. And um, I think it's of vital importance to have a basic understanding of how the internet works so that we ourselves can be creators and not just passive consumers of the internet. And not only that, so that we're equipped to be critical of it because it's, you can't really be critical of something uh, if you don't know how it works or you don't know what's behind the, the, uh, the facade. So actually, to that point, I also organize a conference called Radical Networks in Brooklyn, New York with my colleague Erica Kermani. It's a four-day event that has talks, workshops, and um, an exhibition featuring critical investigations and applications of internet and radio technology. So the spirit of the event is to give beginners and the community a safe space to come learn about and discuss issues such as surveillance, ownership of personal data, and to again dismantle this opaque notion of the cloud. But today, I want to talk about something pretty abstract. Um, something that I've spent a long time thinking about and actually feeling, uh, but I've only recently started publicly talking about um, this idea of visceral systems as applied to sound composition and computer networks. Um, and to sort of unpack that, I want to do it within the following framework of first giving a bit of my background and some of my past influences, and also therefore explaining my, my relationship to sound and networking technology. Um, but first, I need to uh, offer some definitions just to lay a groundwork with the caveat that I'm going to be bending these definitions quite a bit. So the first is, uh, this term visceral um, from medicine that vis visceral referring to the viscera, the internal organs of the body, specifically those within the chest as the heart or lungs or the abdomen as the liver, pancreas or intestines. In a figurative sense, something visceral is felt deep down. It's a gut feeling. Um, and then 
this idea or the the definition of what a system is from from Oxford, uh, a, a set of things working from Oxford Dictionary, a set of things working together as parts of a mechanism or an interconnecting network, a complex whole. So while a visceral system usually refers to the system of the body. I'm bending the term to mean a system which evokes a visceral feeling, feelings of textures, colors, dimension, mass, um, to both sound compositions and communication systems, two systems that I, <laughs> I actually didn't intentionally you know, choose to, that, you know, to work with in order to explore these concepts, but more I just noticed I felt these things in relation to these systems, so they kind of chose me. Um, so, to explain maybe how I got here, I want to back up about 30 years. Um, <laughs> one of the defining influences in my life, um, if, you, if any of you recognize these icons, uh, was discovering two software applications. Um, the one on the left for, is the icon for ResEdit, or Resource Editor. And the one on the right is HyperCard, when I was about 10 years old on my parents' Mac Classic. Um, ResEdit is, oops, ResEdit is an application that was used to create and edit application resources like icon bitmaps, uh, the shapes of windows, the definitions of menus and their contents, and the application code. Um, the first time, you know, me on my parents' computer was often me, especially on, on the Mac, uh, was me just dragging things around the desktop and seeing which would, you know, light up over different applications and then dropping in and seeing what would happen. And unfortunately for them, one of these applications was ResEdit, um, and, uh, which led to many uh, system crashes. But anyway, the first time I was able to open up a piece of software with ResEdit and watch it disassemble into a collection of icons and, uh, and hex code, as whatever as it sounds, made actually a major impression on me as, as a child. I mean, the, the, the code made no sense to me. What I saw made no sense to me at all. I had no idea how to parse what I would stumbled into. Um, so instead of looking at it rationally as a computer program, my child's mind connected to it uh, visually, viscerally even. Um, in, instead of software, I noticed uh, the texture of the black and white characters. Um, I noticed the lines and, and the shapes uh, that came forward out of, um, out of the code. And, uh, you know, while I didn't know what this actually was, I, I knew enough. I knew that it was controlling uh, what was happening up front in the interface. And, and I felt a huge excitement um, at seeing the guts, at, you know, seeing the organs of what I, you know, of an application, of what I previously perceived as a black box that I was only allowed to take at face value. And this sort of gave me this back door into this system, which was really exciting. Um, this is uh, a slide uh, of, uh, of the Mondo 2000 card from the Beyond Cyberpunk HyperCard stack, a compendium of cyberpunk sci-fi and guide to cyber culture that came out in 1990. So, yeah, HyperCard um, is an application that lets you create stacks of so-called cards containing text and interactive images, buttons, text fields, and other GUI elements. Um, it's considered one of the first successful hypermedia systems before the web and was therefore a precursor to the web and had actually a direct influence on how the first browser was developed. Um, also because of, of how it, it allows you to create these non-linear narratives, jumping between cards of text and interactive content, um, you know, with the introduction of hypermedia, really. And, um, you know, being able to move in this non-linear way, you know, really creates a feeling of traversing space, um, in this case, document space. And, um, it really added a dimensionality to what was otherwise a very flat landscape in digital media. Um, so interacting with software in these ways via these programs really started to give digital media a shape and a form in my mind. It's something more than you just look at on a screen and, and you know, as a static thing. Um, 
but as something that, you know, that had guts, that had dimension, that had physical, well, physical-ish properties. And it really established the synesthetic relationship that I would continue to have with media. Um, so I want to talk about sound for a minute. A great, huge inspiration for me is Edgar uh, Ver uh, Verez and his idea of sound objects. That sound occupies space as form and with mass. Verez was a French-born composer um, who spent a lot of time in Paris and in the States, um, working in the first half of, of the 20th century, and, and he's known for conceiving of music as, quote, sound as living matter, um, with the elements in his music as sound masses, organized as crystalline structures. So he, you know, as well, had this, this relationship to sound where it wasn't just something that he heard but it was, it was something that had weight, you know, that had visceral properties about it. And um, he has this quote that, well, this is not his quote, but it's, his quote is, when I was about 20, I came across a definition of music that seemed suddenly to throw light on my gropings towards music I sensed could exist. Um, Josef Maria Hunoronski, uh, the Polish physicist, uh, chemist, musicologist and philosopher of the first half of the 19th century defined music as this, as the corporealization of the intelligence that is in sounds. So giving, giving body to the life that's in sounds. It was a new and exciting conception and, and to me, this is still Ferez speaking, and to me the first that started me thinking of music as spatial as moving bodies of sound in space, a conception I gradually made my own. So, having learned about him and reading about all this stuff and getting really excited that I came across someone else who had this, this relationship to this normally intangible stuff, really encouraged me uh, to, to develop um, this project called Felt the Signal Processing, or FSP for short, um, something I worked on for a number of years, actually, with my sister, Lara Grant, who continues to work as a wearable electronics and textile designer in San Francisco. Um, so together we developed conductive soft interfaces out of regular wool and metal wools, combining them together to, to work as components in guitar, in guitar pedals, synths, and homegrown sound circuits. And yeah, here's a, a picture. <laughs> um, so, my goal with FSP was to take something else that I had a visceral co uh, connection to, sound, and try to create an, an emotional connection to it through an interface that I thought was closer to the texture of the sounds as I experienced them than the hard, discrete knobs, sliders, and buttons. So, in this image, it's, it's um, well, it's a sheet of wool containing um, an effects pedal that I built and, um, and there's these, these felted components that are integrated into the circuit via, via these snaps that I um, attach, I mean, I, I, well, they're, they're just grommets. Well, snaps that I grommeted into this conductive felt that I made. Um, and it becomes a variable uh, resistor also to back up, oops, a bit. So there, there, there's a wire that snaked through, through the raw material, then it's felted up, then I attach the snap, and then I have something that I can solder a wire to and solder it directly into, um, into the circuit, into, into the, the PCB of the effects pedal. So it becomes part of the circuit, the, the signal, is traveling through this felt, and, and as you manipulate it with your hands, you're changing the resistance of it, which is the same as turning a knob or a slider. Um, you're shaping, you're actually shaping the sound with your hands. And um, yeah, we, we made several strange things. Um, this <laughs> was the beginnings of a strange synthesizer. Uh, this was the interface for it with, um, with all these intestine-like tentacles, each of which um, had a core of, of conductive wool. 
and terminated in a snap on, on one end and would connect. Yeah, that's a shot of, of, the, of the conductive wool down the center of it. But these snaps would then connect to the other piece um, and create you know, a, a connection in, in these circuits. And then as you pulled the, 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 the uh, tentacle, again, it, it was creating this, this stretching action, which was changing the, the resistance and shaping the sound that, that was moving through it. So another piece I did was called House FM. Um, I did it in collaboration with a very good friend of mine and sound designer, Helen Tang. Um, it was an on-site installation consisting of multiple Raspberry Pis uh, broadcasting a unique soundscape over a shared FM channel, um, which was set to 90.1 FM. So it was broadcasting off of a pin off, off the Pi in, um, on the same uh, frequency, six of these devices throughout the house. And as participants move throughout the house wearing FM radio-enabled headphones, the audible signal from each Pi would fade in and out as they move towards and away from stations. So in this piece, I was experimenting more with dimensionality, you know, with like creating these sound spaces. Um, it was also an, an experiment trying to pull color and texture out of the corners of the house, out of the feeling, out of the feelings of the corners of the house in which the piece was installed, giving a voice and a body to each of these areas as expressed in the sounds designed by Helen. So, um, earlier I stated that my goal was to take something that I had a visceral connection to, sound, and to try to create an emotional connection to it through an interface that I thought was closer to the texture of sounds as I experienced them myself. But this goal as well extends to my relationship to computer networks. Um, I mean, having a visceral relationship to music and to art is more or less understandable. Um, I think a, a lot of people do. But having one to, to computer networks is a little less obvious and it's something that I, you know, have been really struggling to sort of define, like, for myself what that means. Um, but for whatever reason, though, I, I, I'm compelled to situate networking in the context of sculpture, to design tactile net network systems, and to reference for, for res again, uh, to consider networks or the signals moving over the networks as living matter. But I needed a framework to help guide my experiments and explorations. And I think that framework, where I'm at with it now, because this is really an ongoing research project, is this modified version of Harold Laswell's uh, model of communication as a template for my thinking going forward as I, as well to quote, Ferez, grope my way towards the sculpture I sense could exist. So according to Laswell, this phrase is designed to describe an act of, of communication. It asks who says what, in which channel, to whom, and with what effect. So in the context of sculpture or art, the, the, the who and to whom are straightforward to answer. These are the artist and the audience. Um, which channel refers to the medium? Uh, is it felt? Is it slime mold? Is it cement? Is it paper? You know, what is the physical medium that we that, we, that will be used to link the intangible to something that can be physically in, engaged with or sensed. So, and then says what? I mean, this is the message that the artist is trying to impart from their piece. To me personally, so far in my experiments, the what is wanting to give the intangible a physical presence, like a real world avatar, something that can be engaged with and finally, with what effect? This is, this is the feedback from the audience. This is how does it affect the people who, you know, the who, you know, who are looking at this and experiencing this. How will it make the viewer feel? Um, for me, I, I hope it will impart, again, a, a sense of awareness, you know, that, 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 that these sounds, that these data transmissions, that they, they exist in this in the space that we're in, that, that they have a form even if we can't see it. So um, I wanted to just show a few experiments I've been doing with 
with some of the networking stuff. Um, one of the first ones involves a slime mold called Physarum polycephalum. It's a single cell uh, amoeba slash fungus-like creature. Since about 2010, it's been the focus of interesting research that has taken note of the fact that for being such a simple creature, it tends to display complex and in, in, indeed sophisticated behavior. And it's been used to model various systems from transportation networks to help blood vessels form. It's also particularly noted for its ability to quickly find the most efficient path between food sources, creating efficient transport interconnections networks for ferrying nutrients from, in this photo, these are oat flakes, which is one of their favorite foods. It's basically a decentralized, adaptable network that is able to change in response to a changing environment. And you can clearly see here even how it, it, it starts to take the shape of, of, of a computer network or as, as, as the internet. Um, in this particular experiment, <laughs> I was actually um, seeing if I could find a way to color code uh, data, if you will, that moves through the, the plasmodium network. So, the, so um, as the slime mold ingests food, it breaks it down and then streams it through these tubes. And, and, and it moves in this tidal fashion where it moves forward and then comes back a bit and then forward and back a bit. Um, it, it, it's how it moves, actually. So I wanted to see if I could create color-coded tags you know, like, like trace, trace something, a piece of food moving through the network by color, um, hoping that it, I could somehow create like a, a, a data network um, or, or data packets that were moving through the slime mold and, 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 and know where it had been based on the color that it was. Because, so in, in, in this picture, different oats, I, you know, you see yellow, red, and blue. I used primary colors to dye the oats, hoping that as they ingested the oats and would break it down, as, as different oats from different parts of the petri dish mixed, they, it would also be a color mixer. They, I, I could see, oh, this over here, it's green. So I guess, you know, this, this passed through the, the blue and the yellow node. Anyway, as I said, highly experimental. Um, it's still something that I'm working on perfecting. I haven't quite got it yet. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about real fast was QFM. It stands for Cubed FM. It's a collection of FM transceivers embedded in cast cement cubes, worked on in collaboration with my partner, Danya Vasiliev. Um, together, they form a network of mini radio devices for modeling network topologies um, and travel paths of data from one device to each other. So, I mean, this is a single one, but they're designed to actually work as a group. And they're just sending out a simple um, Morse code signal. And, 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 you know, one sends a pulse, and whoever, wh whichever one's nearby here, the pulse, pick it up and blink an LED to show that they've received it. And it, it's really just a super, super simple way to show data propagation through a network. And this was actually designed as well to, to be used as a teaching tool, which is something that me and also Danya do quite a lot is teach workshops to help explain how networking technology works. So, but it was also a way to just sort of see and appreciate how information travels through a space. Again, giving the sense of dimensionality to things and, and that though we can't see what's in the air um, around us, it's still there, you know, and, and we're situated in it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff I know is super abstract, even for me, and, and I'm often asking myself why, you know, like, like what, what is this, you know? And, you know, one of the greatest challenges of working with networks as an artistic medium, or using networks as material, to use a phrase coined by my studio mate, Julian Oliver, is the fact that computer networks aren't inherently tactile. You can't see them, or taste them, or smell them, or feel them. So how do you create works that engage an, an audience out of computer networks? Um, if they can't experience it with their senses, does a person fully even appreciate what's happening over a computer network if they can't experience it with their senses? Um, and you know, I think it's about changing our relationship to something that is usually considered purely a utility. You know, networking is a very utilitarian thing. It's about moving messages over, you know, from point A to point B. But, but 
is it interesting to look at how uh, networking can manifest itself in other contexts, like in the case of the slime molds? Um, you know, where can parallels be found, and is there meaning to that? And, and by giving something a tangible form, will it make us think about it more, or think about more like what happens over those invisible tubes? Um, so, yeah, you know, the thoughts presented here are, like I said, are, are very experimental and open to discussion, and if this has evoked any thoughts or questions in, in you, I would love to hear what you had to say. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sarah, for your talk. Um, we have time for some questions. So we have uh, four microphones in the room. One, two, three, and four. So if you have any questions, you can uh, just walk up to a microphone and ask your question. Or in the meantime, if we don't have any questions from the internet. So, first question, microphone one. Hi there, yeah, thank you for the talk, very interesting. Um, can we hear some of those sounds that you made with the pedals? Yeah, well, you know, I actually did, I do have a video. I, well, I don't know if we have time for me. To, I'd have to, like, dig it up. Maybe you can find me afterwards and I can play for you. Well, we have fun. We have fun. Okay, well, let me see if I can find. So in the meantime, maybe there's one question from the internet. The question is regarding the wool-based FX pedal. Uh, have you performed live on stage, and uh, does it work like a musical instrument? Um, yeah, actually, I well, you know, I never performed it live on on stage. I it just didn't happen. But I would perform to myself in my bedroom, <laughs> and um, and yeah, I mean, I I used it actually to process my um, voice. So, um, so there, you know, there's a microphone. I was singing into it and and running it through the the effects pedal. And you know, when people sing, you know, it's a full body thing. Sometimes it's like you're using, you're you're moving with your body, your your hands, and 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 it felt really nice to have this like this felt this like this this like warm, comforting felt in my hand that I was. As I was singing, as well as shaping my voice, almost as though it were an accordion. Unfortunately, no video documentation of that. <laughs> But, yeah. Yep. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah. A little break to 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 let you to let you search for the video. Yeah, I'm searching through my sister's Vimeo where, uh, where we had these documented. But, you know, this was actually from, from some time ago. So let me just try to look again. Ah. If I can't find it in time, then by all means, come find me afterwards and I can... Oh, wait. I think I did find it, in fact. Um, actually, if you wanted to, uh, let me see if I can. We actually do have um, an, an archive of our work here at chutka.com slash FSP. If you wanted, if you're curious to see what some of the projects were that we did. Um, does this also have audio out, this HDMI? Well, Let's see if, if this plays, and, and if not, then you can check it out. Oh, I don't think it's going to play, actually. Oh, wait, there's an audio here. Hmm, I think we might, we might be out of luck. Well, if you want to listen, actually, you can, you can visit this, this web page here, and we do have some videos up. Okay, I think... Uh You can you see the address up there. And yeah. it's, it's also on, on the talk uh, site, on, uh, on the um, far plan. So um, you can listen to it there. So there's one question at microphone one. Oh, wait, we hear something. Oh, something is coming <laughs> up. Just a sec. Yeah, this was an, a noise experience. 
experiment. Those are my sister's hands. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, question? Yeah. Yes, short question. How hard is it to be a sound artist in the modern world when we are almost visual media uh, audience? Mostly when you are on talks, there is for sure some projector and video, but sometimes there is a problem with sound, as we saw now. And so when people browse internet, they look for pictures. Yeah. So how it looks like from your perspective? Is easy to reach your audience with sound projects? Well, uh, I mean, to tell you the truth, the sound, I, I included it in this talk because it's, it's, it's relevant to this idea of visceral systems. But um, at the time, uh, I haven't actually worked with sound myself for a number of years. I've been focusing mainly on networking. But... Um, it, I mean, was it my goal, like, that I want to reach an audience online? For example, online or even in exhibition sites, it's sometimes yeah. hard to find the perfect conditions for sound. Experience. Absolutely. Well, so one of the benefits about this is that um, this isn't reliant on high fidelity. This is actually about noise in some way. It's about interference. So actually, that was never an issue. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. So, unfortunately, time is up for this talk. So, thanks again, Sarah, for Thank the you. nice talk. Thank you very much, and a warm round of applause.